Hello, this is Laura Castro. I'm a professor at the University of A Coruña. I am Brujo Benavides. I work as a staff engineer in Nextrol, and I am a member of the Education Working Group at the Erlang Ecosystem Foundation. As I am too. And we are here today to talk to you about detecting Oxford code in Erlang code bases with the highest degree of certainty. And of course, the first thing would be to clarify what we mean by Oxford code. And we're going to do that by telling you a little story that we hope you can relate to. So imagine you have in a large project a module with, uh, in this case, one function. It's called run. You can see it is exported in the third uh, line of the snippet that you see on the screen. And it doesn't really matter what the run function does. Just it's some code that can be uh, invoked from outside this little module. Now, in your development uh, day to day, you, uh, one day you get a ticket saying that we want to slightly modify uh, our project so that the run function can sometimes be actually invoked and some other times um, won't be invoked, just for some maybe testing and for whatever reason. So you roll up your sleeves and there you go. First thing you do, Say it's create a configuration um, parameter. Well, you call it sample rate, and uh, it has a value, and it will be in one of your uh, project co uh, configuration files. Then you go back to your module. But since you're a very um, uh, thoughtful developer, you're going to do some uh, test-driven development. So first thing you do is codify the two main tests for the two situations, the one in which the sample rate will tell you that you don't want to run the function, that will be the ignore test, the first on the right-hand side of your screen, when you can see that we want to assert that we are not running, we're ignoring uh, what the function does. And the second test, in which you will actually indeed uh, invoke the function and you will uh, get the evaluated result because the sample rate is one. So the, those are your tests, and of course, uh, you run them, uh, things will fail. So you have, have to go back to your code and start actually implementing things. First thing will be to, uh, within the run uh, function, actually uh, retrieve that uh, uh, sample rate uh, parameter. And just in case something happens and you cannot uh, recover that from the uh, configuration environment, you also have that macro on the third line. Uh, that will uh, be your default value to, to fall back to. So now you have a sample rate, okay? You have to use it. For that, uh, you change your evaluation, your regular evaluation that you had before, for a maybe evaluate private function in which you will uh, use the sample rate. And so sometimes, and you have a random value for that, sometimes uh, you will um, uh, actually invoke the function that will be the last uh, part in yellow in the right hand side, the maybe evaluate uh, will actually call evaluate, but then uh, right above that, the, the function class before will determine that the random value is not is higher than the, the default sample rate. And then in those cases, we will ignore and will not uh, invoke the function. That will be uh, the functionality that was expected. And if you run the tests, then those will pass now and you're happy. You move on to your next functionality. And maybe you even move on to a different project. Some other developer come to, comes to this project, or just enough time, time goes by that when after some time, the need for that uh, sample rate and the need for that differentiated um, invoking or not invoking behavior is not needed anymore. Of course, a new ticket will appear. In, in the ideal world, you would like to go back in your GitHub uh, history and just uh, remove all the commits that were related to that change. But there are a number of reasons why this may not be possible. You might not even be aware if you're new to the project that there was an original ticket doing exactly the reverse uh, or many other reasons. So, well, if you're le left with only the code, you will inspect what's, uh, what's in there. And if you don't have to differentiate when to uh, actually run or not run the function, and of course, you go first to the tests, and you will remove the tests that are no longer needed because that functionality is the one that you want to remove. You will end up with just the original uh, test, the evaluate test. We want to always evaluate the function. The other we can remove. Then going back to the code, the part of the code where the decision is made to ignore, that is 
irrelevant now, so we want to remove that. And well, that will be it. Functionally wise, I mean, if you run the test now, the test will pass. But I hope you, you are with me in that there are lots of code there that are not actually needed. In fact, we have this maybe evaluate that was introduced that you can see now that three parameters and two of them, uh, two of them are never used. If you're uh, familiar with Erlang, you also will realize that we have two underscores before run and rate. That's the way we usually um, show that we are not interested in doing anything with those parameters within that function close. Uh, so, well, those could be removed. And actually the whole maybe evaluate is going to be really easy to, to simplify because there's a random union value that is not longer needed and that will uh, get us back to having just a sample rate and a parameter and using the parameter to evaluate. Now, remember this maybe evaluate function is private. So we may realize that sample rate is a parameter that even doesn't have the underscore or at, le at least it doesn't have the underscore uh, yet. Uh, is not longer used. So the changes that we might um, need to do in the maybe evaluate will be contained within this module. Because as I say, maybe evaluate is not on the export uh, uh, line, that, uh, that's the fourth line on the snippet. So since we have all the power to modify it and not affecting uh, any other modules, we could just do that and uh, get rid of the uh, sample rate sample rate that we are getting from the run uh, function, the, the core uh, body of the um, run function. And from that removal, we will uh, come to the situation when we realize that we don't actually have to inspect the environment and we can just get rid of that. So we're backtracking, uh, slowly backtracking the, the changes that someone did uh, at some point in the past. Right, so that's the situation where we uh, stand now with all the gray uh, things uh, ready to be removed. And that will be almost, almost uh, as the situation we had originally. Of course, there's some, uh, there's some things that even if you would help yourself with code coverage, for instance, to, to know what things were not uh, actually needed or used, there are things that uh, will be beyond the scope of any other a regular uh, tool to help you. Such uh, will be the case of the macro definition that is not longer used, but no coverage tool will make you uh, aware of that. And of course, there's also the configuration parameter that at some point someone uh, introduced in a configuration file that will also remain silent, silently there. Uh, but it's again, something that no one is using and that was not there at the beginning. So. Ideally, we would be uh, we would like to be able to say, "Hey, this and this should also be removed," and then then is when uh, actually we will uh, be at the same point as if this uh, functionality had never appeared in the project. So I hope you agree with me that we would like to have less code because less code is less code to maintain. So it means a project which is easier to maintain overall, especially since we're talking here a small uh, example, but we are uh, aiming to, to extrapolate this situation to really, really large projects. So what would be the um, underlying pro problem uh, in your own words, Brujo? So basically, what's happening here is that as a developer, I'm faced with the uh, risks of removing stuff. I don't know if I can remove things for sure. For instance, is this macro actually never used? Over here, it's defined in this very small file, but uh, modules can be very large and macros can be defined in header files. So a macro defined in a header file is actually unused I have to check the whole source code to figure out if that's the case or not. And with libraries, that's even harder because header files can be shared among across the borders of libraries. So I have to check them all if I have, say, a project with multiple ones. So it's not easy. And since it's not easy and say I am a newcomer, I just arrived to the project, I don't want to enter the risk of removing that thing and then breaking something that I, don't, I didn't even know about. Uh, what about this parameter? It's called sample rate. 
once it's no longer in the, this part of the code, it is actually unused. Well, to figure it out, if that parameter is actually unused, I have to first check that it's no longer re, uh, retrieved in any place in the code, like this with application getm. But I also need to check that it's not retrieved in a different way, say, uh, getting all the variables from the environment and going one by one doing something. So maybe some piece of the code does that. And uh, if I remove the parameter from the configuration file, I break that part of the code, which is in a completely different module, far away from the code that I need to change. So these two parameters were unused in this function. This was a not exported function. So as soon as I realized that no other function in the module is calling this function with uh, something there, that's fine. But if the, uh, if the function is exported, I again have to check the whole project, all the applications and the libraries to figure out that these two parameters are actually unused. Or to be more precise, they are unused. But if I remove them, I have to uh, adjust the calls to this function from everywhere. And for instance, in this case, we are doing some computation before calling this. If I remove that computation, will I break something? In that case, the, the general feeling over here is, should I remove this? I don't know. And since I don't know, and I'm very careful not to break anything, I keep them. And I keep them here and in many other pull requests, one after the other, and the, these kinds of code pile up over time. They can be quite extensive within, the, within large and uh, older code bases. So we wanted to create something to give developers the certainty they need to actually remove this and leave us with the proper and expected uh, code base, the smallest one. So we created Hank. Hank is a, an Oxbow code checker. It's a, it's a plugin for Riva3 that will help you detect uh, pieces of code that are certainly not, not used and you can remove uh, confidently. It's extensible. Currently, it, it detects about 10 different uh, types of Oxbow code. Uh, we call them rules, you will see in a minute. It's accurate. So, so it, uh, it, if it tells you that you can remove the thing, you will be sure that you can. More on that, more on that also later. You can also define your own rules if you have some particularities that apply only to your code. And it's configurable. So you don't need to run every single rule on every single one of your code files. You can check and decide which ones apply to your project and where. What can Hank detect now? Hank, as of version 1.2.2, comes with eight rules. The first one is unused record fields. In Erlang, there are structures called records that are composed for uh, by multiple fields. When you create them, you usually fill them, fill all the fields, and use the fields wherever you need. But over time, some fields may become unused. But if but there is no tool that uh, requires you to remove them from the record definition. And since, you, since nobody requires to, you to do that, you might not be sure that you can, and so you keep them. That makes your uh, structures larger unnecessarily. So Hank will tell you which fields can be actually removed from the record, thus reducing the footprint, uh, the memory footprint of your application. And also, as, as every other rule, re reducing the amount of code you have to maintain, which is uh, the, the main goal of this. As we saw before, you can have macros that some that were used in the past, but are no longer necessary. And Hank will tell you about them. Like the one on the example, it's in a module, but Hank will also check header files, and it will tell you if you have a macro defined for your whole system that you're not using anywhere. It will also tell you if the whole header file is not used anywhere. If you are not including that file in any module, that file is not needed. 
and so you can remove it. It will also detect configuration options that uh, can be in your uh, application description file, like the one we saw before, or in your config files somewhere. If you have configuration options for your application and you're not consuming them anywhere, Hang will let you know that you can actually safely remove them from the configuration. It will also detect unused function arguments um, for internal functions like the ones we saw before or, or the one in the example here, but it will also detect unused function arguments for exported functions, verifying that they are not actually needed anywhere else. Hank also comes with some slightly opinionated rules, for instance, one to uh, detect if you are defining a behavior. In Erlang, you can define uh, modules that use other modules as callbacks, and they are called behaviors, and the required callbacks are this defined in the way that you see on the screen with the callback attribute. If you require other module to have some functions implemented, it's reasonable that you use those functions from within the module where you are requiring them. And, uh, and if you do, if you follow that rule, Hang will tell you when you have defined a, a callback that you are not using in the module. And then for these two rules, I couldn't figure out how to write in a, a proper example on screen. So trust me, but uh, basically, uh, Hang will tell you when some uh, header files and dire header files or some attributes in header files are only used in one module. In that case, you can move them, you can move everything from the header file or just the particular attributes to the module where they are consumed. And that way you simplify the process of development. In this case, it's not actually a removal, it's more, more like a moving thing. But the thing here is that when a, a macro or a record are defined in one particular module instead of a header file, you don't need to check the rest of your system to verify if they are actually used. You only need to care about the module where they are uh, defined and used. And Hank will tell you when you can do that. And finally, if you need to, if you have other stuff that you know it's Oxbow code and it's only particular to your system, you can define your own rules. You just need to implement the Hank rule behavior with two functions, analyze that will receive the abstract syntax trees of the files in your system and some context. And it has to return the list of instance, uh, the list of Oxbow code pieces that it can find and ignore so that uh, people can specify which files or which functions or which macros to uh, ignore. They are fine. We don't need to warn about those things. Um, with these, you can either contribute new rules to the open source repository. Hank is open source, so you can contribute there. And uh, if not, you can define them particularly for your system and uh, just use them. The question now is how accurate Hank is. Will Hank tell me to remove stuff that cannot be removed in reality? So Brujo was telling you about the specific um, behavior and rules of Hank, but the golden rule behind the design of Hank was accuracy. And what do we mean, do we mean by accuracy here? Well, uh, we could say that uh, a tool uh, that a developer cannot trust or that uh, he or she have, has to or can second guess will not be of much use. So we wanted to um, people uh, using Hank be sure that Hank will never have a false positive. So tell you that you can actually remove something when removing that cannot be, uh, well, or, or can lead to, to something uh, being broken as Rujo was explaining before. We want to give that security, that, that confidence to people using Hank. So Hank will never be wrong. There will there can be uh, pieces of Oxford code, so meaning a uh, code that is not actually longer needed, you can, uh, could remove it, that will slip through Hank. So that could still be possible. And we talk about uh, that a little bit more than in, in future work. 
but the ones that Hank will point to will be safely uh, to remove from your project. That is the main idea and that uh, is the golden rule that uh, rules the decisions that were made in the implementation and still uh, rule the, the decisions in the implementation of Hank. All right, and so this was created a year ago and uh, we wanted to try to see how effective Hank was at detecting Oxbow code in a project. But for projects to have a large number of Oxbow code pieces, they have to be large and they have to be maintained for a couple of years, for, for a long time, because this thing is something that piles up over time slowly, but steadily. So we checked some large projects. We checked first Erlang OTP, the oldest Erlang code base in the world, and uh, by some means, one of the largest ones. It, it's maintained by a large number of developers. Some of them are no longer in the project. They, they keep changing over time. So there is this whole situation of people has to implement things and don't really know the code base. Okay, so we tried to run Hank on it and uh, Hank actually found quite a lot of things. Uh, a lot of unused macros, a lot of unused record fields. It finds, it found many uh, function arguments that were no longer needed and even one unused configuration option. Erlang OTP is the code that runs everywhere. That code runs in every single Erlang project in the world. So cleaning this one up, it's a major fit. And so uh, we contributed this report to the Erlang OTP team. And some of the things they found like were, on, were done on purpose, but some others were actually unused code. So the cleanup already started. Then uh, we checked another one of, uh, of the very large code bases that are written in Erlang and are open source uh, in the world. We checked uh, Kazoo by 2600 uh, hertz. It's a very large umbrella project that is a repository with multiple projects within it. And uh, it has plenty of files and with, with lots of developers that had worked on it. We found less stuff than with Erlang OTP, but still uh, we found unused macros, we found unused record fields. We found a lot of unused function arguments. We found header files that were not included everywhere and three unused configuration options. So for reference, that's on a 400,000 lines of code. We found these pieces. And finally, we checked with a project that we knew that was very carefully maintained, Mongoose IM by Erlang Solutions. This project, I personally was part of it in the past and currently I know the developers that work on it and I know how this, what, what the standards for developing this project are and uh, they are very high. And so we were expecting not to find that many uh, Oxbow code instances. Still, we found 90 unused macros and more than 200 unused function arguments. So if the question was, uh, is Hank useful? The answer is definitely yes. So, and how, and how useful uh, do you think is being now after one year? After one year, we uh, we know for certain that it's used in some very large code bases. The ones in Nextroll where I work, we check every single project, uh, open source or otherwise, with Hank and we clean up a lot of unused code. Uh, we have some very large Erlang web servers uh, with the code that's been there for a decade. So it, it was very fruitful. We know that it's also used in Klarna and some pieces of Hank are included in the Erlang language server, which is also developed by people working for Klarna. So again, another large and old code base that is Check constantly now with uh, Hank, also in Miniclip, Nova, and more than 30 open source repositories. The thing here is, once you put Hank on your uh, continuous integration pipeline, it will prevent you 
from introducing uh, Oxbow code in every pull request. And that's a great thing that helps people stay clean in this, in this regard, like forever, as, lo as long as they use the, the plugin. <laughs> And you can see that every day there are uh, a thousand and eight hundred or more um, downloads of, of Hank. And that's because uh, the CI pipelines for all these tools, for all these repositories, include this tool, which is great. It's not the most popular Rivar 3 plugin yet, but <laughs> who can tell? Maybe someday, right? It's very easy to, to integrate on CI, particularly because it's a Rival 3 plugin, so you just need to add it to your configuration file, and that's it. And uh, it's generally fast, so it's usually a good addition, a good addition to your to your continuous integration. Of course, it's still not done. There are many things to do in in this uh, tool and related stuff. For instance, uh, Hank only. Oh, spoiler. Anyway, <laughs> for instance, Hank only works on Erlang, of course, so far. But uh, the concept of Oxbow code applies to uh, every single language uh, out there. You will find similar tools for Java and other small, and other small, uh, and other languages. But uh, there are not too many. It's a fairly empty area of research and implementation so you can uh you can take from this from from this project the inspiration to build your own oxbow code detector for your favorite language uh, particularly for other languages with uh, with a similar code like elixir it's a great candidate you can copy the rules from from hank and implement them as elixir rules as well of course as Laura was saying before, Hank doesn't currently detect every single instance of Oxbow code. We are sure that there might be some other rules that we didn't thought of it yet. So if you come up with an idea of some pieces of code that are uh, no longer used in your system, just write an issue on the GitHub repository for River 3 Hank, and we can take care of it. Or as I said before, you can implement your own rule and contribute to the community or use it on your projects only. And finally, there are improvements that can be made to the existing code base, particularly working with the abstract syntax tree of Erlang is not a trivial thing by any means. Uh, and, uh, and what we did was some workarounds uh, around some pieces of uh, strange um abstract syntax tree representation particularly for macros and whatnot so those things can be heavily optimized either in hank or hopefully in the erlang syntax modules uh, in the in erlang otp so if you wanna if you wanna work on that that will be highly appreciated for hank and for other river three plugins that work with the same abstract syntax trees there are performance optimizations we followed uh, Joe Armstrong's rule. So we made the code beautiful and we didn't reach the point where we really, really need to make it fast. So we didn't. The code is still beautiful and it's fast enough. But if you find uh, yourself on a large project and some rule is taking too much time to, to analyze your code, just let us know. We can work together on the optimizations uh, required. And of course, Every rule comes with some particularities, some edge cases, and we aim, as we said before, for a full accuracy. So if you find some edge cases where Hank is warning you about something that you can remove and you cannot remove it actually, open an issue on the repository and we will make sure to include that edge case in the rule definition. So what we would like you to take home after this talk is the story that we presented here. If you related to it at any point and you're within the Erlang community, then you know that Hank is there for you. It's a reverse plugin, so very easy to incorporate to your daily routine of development. 
and it's a static uh, code analyzer that will inspect your code base and safely tell you this can be removed with no second thoughts. And if you're outside the Erna community, then you have an example of not only how to do it, but also how useful it can be, as uh, Bluehost was uh, showing in the projects that were analyzed as part of the um, development of Hank, and also how the community is welcoming the tool and actually incorporating it to, to the different projects, at least, at least the open source ones that we know about. If you want to know a little bit more about the inside, of how Hank was made and, and uh, well, all the, the, um, the, well, the little things uh, that influenced the decisions. Then there's an academic paper uh, published at the Erlang Workshop by Brujo and myself last year in 2021. You can uh, very easily find it online, but if you don't, just reach out to either of us and we'll be happy to, to let you have a copy uh, for yourself. And that's it from us for today. So we can, you can find us online uh, with those handles. I am El Brujo Alcón everywhere. Laura is Laura M. Castro everywhere. And if you want to, if you're on your way out, you want to kill some dead code for us, it will help us a lot. Thank you very much. Thank you.